Oh. Man, this 12 o'clock service. You guys are ready today. They are. It was crazy yesterday because Pastor Stephanie did this session. And if you are a part of our serve team and you were not at Team Weekend, we just, even though we are a non-denominational church, we would like to put a little Catholic guilt on you uh, for not coming. Three people got that joke. Three people Great. got that. That's a dad joke. Okay. But uh, Pastor Stephanie did a thing that basically that your tribe uh, attracts your your vibe attracts your tribe. I got it right there. So your vibe attracts your tribe. And so we were talking a lot about culture. And one of the things that we're doing the board of people, what is Oasis to you or what is a word that comes to you about Oasis? I've never heard this about a church in my life. Somebody put lit. Did you remember? Uh, uh, yeah, that this, that, oh, that was you. Oh, I thought it was somebody important. It was you. Okay. So this, <laughs> so this church is lit, but I think we are the only church I've ever been to that we started Friday night with a team like crazy. They just like what you saw these guys, Hunter, uh, Ashley, they kicked it off as crazy and we ended it with what we call now. What do they call those now? A fire tunnel. Have you ever heard what a fire tunnel? Where's my old church folk? It's called a prayer line. Okay. But they modernized it and turned it into a fire tunnel and we had people receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we had people getting healed. It was incredible. Are we the only church in town that yeah. can start with the dance, 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 dance. party? Yeah. yeah, and then go into that. So that's just incredible, exciting about what we're doing. Then today we both get to preach. So you're about to get a double whammy. That's why we're on the chairs because we've been preaching all week. So Alex, this past week, actually preached one of the greatest messages. I just cracked myself up. I don't know. <laughs> But I, it's 12 o'clock. You never o'clock. know what you're going to hear. But, uh, uh, yeah, I roast people when I'm tired, so I'm trying to behave myself. But Alex, Friday night, if you were not here, we had several people say it. But even though um, he's our son and he is pastor here at Oasis, but he preached, I, in my opinion, if not the greatest sermon to volunteers and to the house and to a heart of a house and the reason we do things, if not the greatest, one of the greatest I have ever heard. And if you were here, how many of you can witness that? It was absolutely incredible uh it was incredible so in doing that we just decided we want to come back today and we want to make sure that you catch the heart of what was said all weekend because even if you're a guest here you have to understand that we are entering into an era this is our 12 o'clock our nine o'clock now here's this was funny alex literally screamed at our volunteers friday night he did for real did not scream because I was last, passionate. I mean, passionate that's what you're supposed to say i was passionate about yeah it. give up your seat that's great. Is that screaming? Okay. Did he do that for real? Hunter? Okay. He did that. Firing it. Now, Isha, you were here. Give up your seat. So this morning, here's what that he was talking about the 1030 service because we had guests come last Sunday. Yeah, you got to give them the context. In. We had guests that had to leave. They could not come in the 1030 service because it was so packed. We had every, uh, every chair in the building. We had people standing. They came. They literally left. And we were like, no, wait to the next service. But that was inconvenience. They couldn't stay. And it broke our hearts. So he's preaching that. So this morning we show up and our nine o'clock service was totally crammed. Back. But we walked in at 1030 and like, here's the church, here's the steeple, but where's all the people? <laughs> but then you showed up at 12 o'clock. Give yeah, God praise on, for this. So, that's awesome. so talk a little bit about that concept. Of what yeah, we- so we one of the things I opened up with was just a great revelation that I've had from uh, Chick-fil-A, which I, yeah. those of you that know me, I think I may preach more about Chick-fil-A than I do the Bible. I've been corrected. Yeah. He wants to be sponsored. That. He wants to be the first pastor ever to be sponsored by Chick-fil-A. To have an endorsement. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll wear oh, a sticker every time I preach. Yeah, if they, I'll wear a hat. Yeah, everything. we'll we'll do whatever. But but we were talking about this idea of uh, actually this story that we've heard about Truett Cathy. And Truett Cathy is the founder, the originator. He was the, the first CEO, the owner of Chick-fil-A. And uh, at this point, this was quite a while after Chick-fil-A had been open. I think this was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And at that time, Chick-fil-A's main competitor was Boston Market. And I know we don't really have any Boston Markets around here. I think the first, the closest one's in Colleen Yankees or something. Way, no, it's Kyle. Coke, way up, way, yeah, way yeah, up in yeah, Kyle, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we don't really have that many Boston Markets around here. But at that time, Boston Market was outpacing Chick-fil-A in every way. So they were having more sales, more franchises. They were getting more popular. And so all of the people, if you're a business person, if you work in sales, that's not a, usually a good thing when your main competitor starts outpacing you. And so all of the people that worked in Chick-fil-A, all of the board members and the different trustees and operators, they started saying, well, what can we do to fix this? And so they started having this meeting and Truett Cathy was in this meeting, but he kind of sat in the back. He's very elderly, very frail at this point, usually never said anything in the meeting. He's like, I'm just going to let these young guys run with it. And so they were talking about all these things that they could add to Chick-fil-A to try to 
con- to compete with Boston Market. And so they were like, okay, we could add a, a we could add a hamburger, we could add a fish sandwich, we could do this, we could do that, we could change the recipe of our chicken sandwich, we could do all these different things. We could do roast beef. He's trying to preach my sermon for me. Uh, we could do all these different things to to try to add on to what Chick Fil A is doing. And so so in the middle of all this, it said that Truett Kathy again. You have to imagine a, a frail older man hold hold the table for me. So in the middle of all, he just he just slaps the table. I just want to, he, just, yeah. he just he slaps the table and and he's very frail. He's very old. So everybody kind of turns around and they're like, oh, well, he's about to say something. What's he about to say? And so he just says just just out of nowhere. What's that got to do with chicken? All the stuff you're talking about, all these ideas, all these strategies, all these new ways of doing things. What's that got to do with chicken? Because we're Chick-fil-A and we sell chicken. We sell chicken sandwiches and waffle fries. We have a few other things, but that's our main focus. So I know you're trying to add all this other stuff. I know you're trying to do all these new things, but what's that got to do with chicken? And so in the middle of that, they did rework some things, but what they did is they just went back to the basics and they said, okay, how can we make our chicken better? How do we just sell more chicken? How do we get it out faster? How do we say that that's where the the phrase is like my pleasure. And and so thankful to serve you those things started because they said let's not add all these new things Let's just do what our base thing is better, but it went back to his mission Yes, the thing is before we get to that part His mission was when he started chick-fil-a was to get a chicken meal in the hand of a working man That had five minutes or less coming out of the factories for their lunch And so a full chicken sandwich that he wanted to get a full meal in their hand That was his mission and so what they were doing is all this other stuff No, it's really not about chicken. It's about the hard working man that's providing for a family and I'm going to do that through the medium of chicken. So we have to go back through our mission. It just blows my mind. Yeah. And so what we decided this weekend, and we have some wristbands, you probably see some of our volunteers, some of our servant leaders wearing these, is we said, hey, it's real simple. Here at Oasis, there's a lot of things that we want to do. There's a lot of vision that we have. We're going to be talking about some vision today for the church, some vision for your life. There's so many things that we can add on to, but really when it comes down to it, it's about Jesus and it's about people. people. Jesus is our message and people are our heart. Jesus is our message. And people are a heart. So everything we do has to come through the lens of Jesus and loving people, serving people. And so we just said it real simple. We don't really have a new mission for this year. We're just going back to what God has already called us to do, to serve Jesus, to love Jesus, but then also introduce people to him and his and saving grace. I know grace. people that make their version of church, they confuse it with Jesus. No, when your version of religion or your version of Christianity or your version of doctrine keeps people from meeting Jesus, you're wrong. That's not our mission. Our mission is to allow the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And that, that is our purpose. But sometimes in our purpose, we have to go back and review our packaging. Yeah. Come on. Come on. I was on an airplane. That'll preach, by the way. But I was on an airplane several years ago. Preach it. You're preaching right now. Mm, okay. So about, about, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, Stephanie and I, and many of you know, we were a part of a, of a denomination our entire life. And we preached and did coaching and were in different uh, conference schedules basically every week talking. And one of the things that was breaking our heart at that point in the denominational background is they were saying that basically at that point, only 8% of preacher's kids even stayed saved after they graduated high school. They would leave not go to 8%. I don't know what it is now, but I was raising children. Alex would have been younger then. Elena was a lot younger then. Alistair, I don't know if he was even around then. He was about two years old maybe at that point when I'm reading that. And so I begin to weep on a plane because I'm reading a business book that's telling me things that I know are affecting me as a pastor because what Jack Welch, who was the chairman, uh, the CEO of General Electric, he said, we have entered into a commercial consumer um, market to where we have created this culture where the packaging is as important as the product. If you don't believe that, he did a whole study on the generic uh, movement. How many of you remember about 30 years ago, the generic movement, the what you do, you just dated yourself. You're over 40. Okay. The generic movement is you had the white bags and the white box. They were white with black letters. And it just said like cereal, cornflakes, potato chips, 
oatmeal. Didn't have, it didn't have Uncle, what is his name? Uncle Ben or whatever his name. I don't know. I don't, Uncle Tom, whoever he was. Uh, Tony the Tiger. <laughs> Tony the Tiger, whatever. It was just generic. And he said, we have raised a culture to where people will prove they will pay double for something that is packaged correctly or differently right. that they don't want generic. They right. want the proper branding. So what this did was this created a consumer culture beginning about 40 years ago. And there was about a 20 year curve. Well, anything that happens in the real world will eventually creep into the church world. I feel yeah, like preaching on, here on, because on. we have been called to pull people out of culture, but most times the culture influences the church yeah. more than the church influencing the culture right. because the church just wants to keep having church and ignore the fact that the yeah. real world is lost come and going on, to hell. On, on. About 87% of our region don't attend church. So instead of me telling them that they're sinners and going to hell, I have to create a model. I have to create a system that makes them want to be a part of what Jesus has called me to reach because grandma's church isn't cutting it or we would all be there. Come on. Come on. I feel like preaching. I'm going to preach in this one. I just feel it right now. But then he said, he said, we are coming to a consumer market. I just reread this a few weeks ago and I wept. I remember weeping on an airplane. This is before Stephanie and I made a lot of transition and a lot of changes and about our family. Because the Bible says one thing that never left me. He said, Noah built an ark for the saving of his household. What are you willing to risk and what are you willing to change? And what are you willing to be uncomfortable about for the saving of your children and grandchildren? Wow. Wow. And one thing that Jack Welch reminded, and he said, he said, but not only are we in a generation now where the packaging is as important, we are entering a generation where the packaging will become more important than the product. You didn't get that. The packaging will become more important than the product. Guess what? That was 16 years ago. Look around you. We are living in a generation that people will pay double or triple for half of what they could have got right. if it was generic. I've had people tell me, I'm fixing to preach right now. I've had people tell me, I will go to a church that doesn't even preach the doctrine that I believe, but I will attend that church because they have the packaging that my children have to have. And I would rather go somewhere with the packaging, even though they don't even even think they preach all the truth because it is now even coming to the church. So if we're missionaries and we realize that, that it's about the packaging, then we're going to stand in judgment and we're going to be talking about how good our chicken is. But Truman, Truman Kathy had to decide at that point, no, we're not going to change our chicken, but we're going to create a packaging yeah. and a culture of it's my pleasure that I will leave Popeye's. I will sit in line. I've done it. God help me. I will sit in line 20 minutes at Popeye's, get mad, have already given them my money and I'm sitting on a curb waiting on my chicken 20 minutes later, leave my money and my chicken, drive to university, go to Chick-fil-A, pay double for somebody to tell me it's my pleasure. How may I serve you? And I got it in three minutes. So if that's happened in the commercial world, I'm telling you it's happening in the church. So as we're going forward at Oasis, we have deputized our serve team this weekend, and I'm deputizing you. How do we become missionaries, and how do we repackage this thing where people have an opportunity to meet Jesus and hear the gospel? Because it's about Jesus and people. It's not about my music. It's not about my cross. It's not about my robe. Yeah. It's not about my preaching style. Yeah. If I breathe heavy, if I preach, or if Alex sits down and sings, uh, Mary had a little lamb, who the heck cares? What I want to know is Jesus being preached yeah, is on. the cross being exalted yeah. are people being baptized are people being healed are people being delivered are people being set free because it's all about the cross there you go there you go it's a nutshell yeah you go ahead and read that okay come on <laughs> john chapter 21 this is really what god kind of began to reveal some of these things to us and again we, we're going back to this whole idea of reimagine we want to reimagine some things in the church, but also reimagine some things in your life. John chapter 21, starting in verse one says this, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the sea of Tiberias. And this way he showed himself. Simon, Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. They didn't get their name called out. They must have not been important, but two other disciples were together. Simon, Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Now you have to get the context of this because this is after Jesus goes to the cross. This is after Peter spends a couple years with Jesus. This is after Jesus reappears to them. All, all these sort of things. I'm sorry, this is before he reappears, but this is after the cross. And, and these disciples, they're disappointed. Because they've been with Jesus, they've been with him all this time, and they thought he was going to take over the world. They thought he was going to kick out all the Romans. They thought all these things, and, and then Jesus died and, and, and went into a grave. And so Peter says, I'm going fishing. 
I'm going back to what I know. I'm going back to what I'm comfortable with. These men, they were fishermen. They owned businesses. They were successful. And so they said, well, I guess this hasn't worked out. So we're going to go back to what's easy to us. We're going to go back to what we know. So he said, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also, all the other disciples. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. So these are professional fishermen. These people know what they're doing. They went back to what they knew and it didn't work for them. They caught nothing. But when the morning had come, come on, how many of you thankful for a new day, a new morning when God comes into your life, when something new, when there's a shift in your life. But when morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. They, and Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. They had to do something different. They had already tried what they had known before, but they had to do something different. And so as a church, but also in your life, there may be maybe many of you here today that as we're a month into 2019, as we're doing these new things where you have already begun to slip back into the old way of doing things, slip back into the way that you knew it worked before, but now it's not working for you. You're saying these things that used to fulfill me, these things that used to make me happy, these things that used to satisfy me and bring me joy and and bring me all these different things. They used to work, but they're not working anymore. Jesus had given them a plan for three and a half years. He gave them his dream. He had called them. They were fishers. They were fishers, and he called them to be fishers of men. But how was it working out for them? Now they've been, uh, they're, they're disillusioned. They're disappointed. And we find. Their and church hurt. Their, their church. Oh, my God. Their church hurt. Look at somebody say their church hurt. That's exactly what's going on. And so Jesus has given them all these promises. But here's the thing. The first thing that you do when you are disappointed is you go back to your default of what worked for you before you got disappointed. And before they met Jesus, they were successful at fishing. But when they go back trying to do what they did before they met Jesus, the Bible said that they catch nothing. And I just feel in this series as we're reimagining church and reimagining all kinds of things, I want to make sure that me included, because I've seen it happen in my own ministry, that when I'm discouraged, when my dream has died, when I'm in my default zone, immediately I go back and do it the way I used to do it or the way somebody else is doing it or another church is successful doing this. But I have to be reminded. Minded. What did God tell me? Yes. What is a word yes. from the Lord? And there's a new day coming. And then Jesus told him something. He said, I want you to do completely opposite of what you've been doing. Right. I want you to cast it on the other side. And I want to know how many of us would allow our own marriages, our own bodies, our own families, our own ministries, our own careers, and our community fall apart under us because we don't have the guts or the boldness or wow. we're so full of pride. We refuse to stop what's not working and cast on the other side and do what God said do. Wow. Wow. So we're reimagining church. And one of the things that we're reimagining, and we say this a lot, is that we want to be a 21st century expression of a first century experience. experience yeah. Now let me break that down for you. Cause I know there's a lot of you that's like, Oh, that's cool. I get it. But what's that mean? So in the first century, after Jesus goes back into heaven, the disciples, they're sent out in Acts chapter two, they have an experience. And many people, this is where we get the term Pentecostal from or Pentecost. They have this experience with God. But how many of you know, we've had a lot of things happen in the world since the first century. Yeah. Like, like how, how many of you know, how many of you in here speak Aramaic? Anybody speak Aramaic? Anybody speak Hebrew? Any, any, any Greek, anything like that? How, how many of you men, when you're out in public, some of you may do this at home, but how many of you in public, you wear a dress and sandals when you go to work? No. Any, anybody out there? How, how many of you, how many of you drove more than three miles to get to church today? That is probably everybody in here. And so all of those are things that have changed since the first century. And so we can't do church the same way that they did it back then, because just for example, they would see the same people every day. They would walk past the same stores. They would walk past the same neighbors. They actually talked to their neighbors. They knew people. They all, many of them, multiple families would live in one house. And so it's very different than the world that we live in today. So we don't want to lose that power. We don't want to lose the experience that they had. But we have to realize we live in a different world. We live in a different culture. Well, I think we've shrunk it down to one day. On the day of Pentecost, we, we shrunk it down to an right. experience. It was an experience that was only based on three and a half years of walking with the Messiah. Right. 
That experience would have not happened if there hadn't have been three and a half years of the Word. John calls him the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I think we're expecting churches to have a Pentecostal experience without ever teaching their people about Jesus. Wow, that's good. No, no, it's going to get quiet for a minute. But, but you do know in Acts chapter 2, there's this little verse called 238. When Peter gets up and says, repent. But he never said repent until the hearts of the people were so pricked that they asked Peter, what must we do to right, be saved? Right. The Holy Spirit spoke to me a few years ago. He said, why are you commanding something that you haven't preached the cross strong enough to prick the hearts of the hearer? He said, if you'll preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, I will prick hearts with the gospel. When I prick hearts with yeah, the gospel, on, they don't need on. a Bible study. They need a command. Just tell them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy wow. Ghost. But he said, you're preaching Acts 2.38. You're answering a question that nobody is asking the question because you don't know how to preach Jesus enough. So what we choose in Oasis, I want to detox from cultural Pentecostalism. I want to get detox from the baggage of a hundred-year-old organization or concept, but I want to have the fresh fire of the empowerment of the super supernatural power of God. I had to stand up on that one. I had to stand up on that one. People say, y'all sitting down because you want to be cool? No, we sitting down because we is tired. We tired. We tired. <laughs> we not trying to be cool. This is, I preach, what, eight times this week? You preach four times this week, five times? So this is the concept, though. How many of you did you just resonate with that? We need more Jesus and less philosophy. We need more Jesus and less division. We need more Jesus. It just We got to be Jesus and people. Jesus and people. So we're reimagining church. And then as we reimagine church, there's really two parts of church. Yeah. And the, the first is discipleship. Yeah. So we have to reimagine discipleship. And I want to read this to you from Matthew chapter 28. For some, it may be very common. For some, it may be brand new. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing that we talked about this past weekend, that our core value of Jesus and people, it says that people are a heart and that we have a heart for all people. That's why you'll notice we're very intentional. We always want to have blended people in our church, blended yeah. people in, in What's leadership. What's on your stage stays. Right. What's on your stage stays. So we want everybody to see everybody. Women, diverse color, diverse economic, whatever. We want you to see Education, you. status, everything. everything. Yeah. And so if our heart is for all people, then we can't just be satisfied with some of the people. Because a lot of people say, well, we're going to go into all nations and we're going to disciple people and all that. But, but we settle for the few people that we do have and the few people that are coming on a Sunday when we have to realize that this is just this is like a, a base where we all come get fired up yeah. and then we're sent out to disciple people yeah. in our lives. So, so, OK, you just hit something. We didn't hit the other two services. I feel. <laughs> so what if we reverse this thing? Because in American culture, Sunday is where we come to get pumped up. Yeah. For the rest of the week. So it's not about unsaved people. It's not about the loss. It's about saved people being so broke, so busted, so discouraged, not living an overcoming life. So they come in and we spend an hour of worship trying to pump them up enough where they feel better than a preacher's three steps to a testimony, five steps to a blessing. You're going to get your help if you come to my church. And so when we do that, what we do is, is we create a self-help climate yeah. where people become dependent on the emotionalism of the pulpit and the music. What if it wasn't about propping you up for the rest of the week what if this was a celebration of what yeah, you've done on, the other six days hey pastor I laid hands on her I fed her I took care of that single mom I put gas in that car I healed that sick that cancer was healed that dead person was raised and we are celebrating what God has done through his church which look at somebody say you're the church I'm sorry you keep standing up in this service I, th I think you get more energy I just saw James. I want to preach. Just, well, yeah, come on. So, <laughs> where were we? It's hard to go back to the points after that. Ah. I'm just like, just keep going. But one of the things that we've talked about that many people, when you think of discipleship, if you've been in church, you're probably thinking about coming early in the morning, 730 on Sunday morning, coming to Sunday school, going in yeah. some smelly back room with yeah. some nasty coffee and a yeah. chalkboard yeah. and some guy up on a on a, a stage or in the front yeah. saying, well, let me teach you something. And usually it's somebody that never let teach in real church, <laughs> but they'll put them back there trying to right. give them a ministry, not right. knowing they're running off people. So, yeah. so, so uh, roasting, you know, 12 o'clock roast service. 
But but what we're doing, and so we'll say, well, I'm, I'm going to teach you something. Yeah. I'm going to show you something. But what discipleship is, what we have to realize is there is a lot more that's caught than taught. A lot of our Christian walk and a lot of our life, we catch things. We don't just learn them in a classroom. Oh, so and good. so discipleship, it may not look like coming to a class and let me teaching you three steps and let me teach you these things. Discipleship in your life, because you're saying, well, I can't teach anybody. I don't know. I don't know the, all this doctrinal stuff. I don't know all these scripture verses. Well, for you, it may just be like, hey, let's go to coffee. Let's go to lunch. Hey, why don't you come work out with me? Hey, why don't we go golf together? And in that process, you may talk about hey man like what's going on in your life and well this is going on well hey me and my wife we went through that same situation and here's how we reacted here's how we overcame that here's how i overcame that addiction and so you may not be sitting down teaching them but they're going to learn so much more by you saying hey this is how i've done it and follow me as i follow jesus i think this is the huge thing right here that you're on the model now some of you this is going to hurt you discipleship is not indoctrination and what most churches call discipleship class is they are indoctrinating you to their way of belief. But what if we truly believe that truth is a person and not a philosophy? So what if instead of discipleship, what if it's mentorship? And what if Paul understood it when he said, follow me as I follow Christ? Because I'm going to show you by example. I'm not going to force it down your throat. I'm going to show you my life. And when you see how I treat my wife, how I treat my kids, how I work a hard day's work, how I pay tithe, how I'm drug free, uh, drunkenness free, how I don't cuss most days when I'm trying to do my best serving the Lord. When you see that, you begin to emulate and say, okay, I'm not mature enough yet. I don't know Jesus, but I know you. So I want to follow Paul as Paul's following Christ. Because it's just admitted. Most people that you know don't even have a bible or if they have one they never read it but they're reading you yeah yeah so what if we created a culture to where our mature believers felt this burden and yoke of mentoring and we yeah. have some that do if, no one in this church that's a mature believer should ever eat alone unless you just want to need some private time but you ought to be scanning the audience for who can i take to chick-fil-a yeah, who can i go well today it's Popeye's. chick-fil-a is closed yeah. but who can i who can i take what can i do how can i mentor these people in this area of life because we have people a few weeks ago i'll, I'll tell you this story but i was at lunch one of the men here that had been in prison had gone through some things or whatever he since moved but he he wanted to take me out and and he told me i want to talk so i was ready i had my my thoughts my little stuff my little doctrine because most people ask the same thing so he looked at me and his question was so crazy he said i want to know between you and me you and pastor stephanie been married how long at that point i think it was 31 years he said in 31 years i said yes and he said you said you were a virgin when you married i said yes he teared up and he said before god look me in the eyes i've been in prison and i'll know it he said before god have you ever been unfaithful to miss stephanie and I was able to look him in the eye and say, absolutely not. He started crying. He said, forget this other stuff. Teach me that. And he actually said this statement. He said, more than a preacher, I need a father. And I wonder what would happen at Oasis if we have people that aren't my age. We have people that may be like Alex in their 20s, but you have something that God has brought you through that you could take and give that to people and pass that on to people. That's the model of disciple. We want to reimagine. Say reimagine. Reimagine. So in that model, we're changing our whole Wednesday night setup. We're going to have a probably even deeper, crazier, wilder, longer, more prophetic Wednesday night model that we're starting this time. It'll be, I believe this week is Robert Rivera's coming. And I, it needs to be packed because a few weeks ago, the Lord says it's time to bring in the prophets. So what we do, we don't just bring in anybody. If we, if, you, if we endorse a prophet, we want you to know that we know their character. We know they've been married to one wife. We know they pay their tithe and their bills. We know that they're accountable to, to apostolic oversight when they give a word and we're bringing in a man of God like that Wednesday night we're going to have a prophetic service but then after that we're designing on our other Wednesdays every month we're going to have breakouts that may be video led you'll have facilitators but it'll be in a group setting where we're going to talk about faith steps finan uh, not financial faith uh, freedom and family family steps and they'll have facilitators because I think that one of our greatest slacks is a church. We have incredible Sundays. We have incredible community. But we need a place where we can sit together in a format to where there may be a little video class, 15 minutes, or we may teach faith class. But then around these tables, we're going to have questions. And you are going to say what that word means to you. And somebody that may be an unbeliever get a chance to be taught by you on things that God, and we'll help one another. That's Now, 
later on, we hope it goes to small groups. I hope it spreads all over Austin, all over the world, and you're all doing it on your own. But before that, we want to give you a model where we can do it in a safe place and teach you how to do it here. But once we get it in a safe place, what would happen by this summer if we honestly get our faith right, our families right, and get freedom from everything? that It may not be drugs. You may need to get free from religion. But whatever you need to get free from, we have those steps in community, and we're helping one another get there. Come on, we're getting there and we're doing it together. It's together. not just, it's not in, just in community. It's not just rows. It's circles, people talking to each other, people talking across each other. So, so we have discipleship. And then the second part of that is we have to reimagine evangelism. And a lot of times in evangelism, and I've heard it said this before that us as Christians, our job is we have to go and seek and save the lost. That we're about to go, we're supposed to go into the world and we, we got to get these people saved. We got to yeah, work on these saved. people. Got but saved. that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19 says, for the son of man, and that's another phrase for Jesus, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so we have to realize that as a church, as Christians, as believers, we can't save anybody. Like we don't have the power to save no. anybody. And so what we've done is we've, a lot of times we've cut people off because we try to cram something down their throat and we try to get them saved before they ever really even know what they need to be saved from. And so our model is instead of trying to go out and get people saved, we know we can't save them in the first place. So here's our thing. We're going to seek and serve the lost. So only Jesus can seek and save them, but we can seek and serve them. And so what we're doing is we're doing a couple different ways. And Pastor David, last week, if you guys weren't here, you can look it up on our YouTube, on our podcast. He gave us a great, easy, very practical way that we can serve people. Because people aren't used to being served. That's one of the things we mentioned about Chick-fil-A, why they're so successful, is because they actually act like they're serving you. Like they're there to help you, whereas a lot of places aren't like that. In the world that we live in today, no one has time for conversation. No one has time to help people. No one has time to open the door for people. No one has time to say thank you or how is your day or man you having a good day anything that man it looks like you're having a bad day you know anything going on nobody has time for that and so what, what pastor david was telling us is one of the simple ways is if you're in the coffee shop or at the gym or on your job wherever the thing that you can do is you can just say hey can i pray for you and, and most people I, I would go to say probably pretty much everyone even if they're not a believer even if they're a different religion they need some prayer Because the world we live in today, everybody needs more money. They need help in their relationships. They need a promotion on their job. They they need something. So they're like, yeah, I don't know who you're praying to, but I'll I'll accept the prayer. They'll take prayer. And so we can pray for them. And that's a simple way where we can serve them. Whereas, hey, it's not about us. Yeah, we've got stuff to do. Yeah, I've got to get to my appointment. Yeah, I've got kids in the car. Yeah, I've got all these different things going on. But it's like, I want to serve you. I'm going to take a few moments out of my day and encourage you and pray for you and serve you. Here's another paradigm. You ready for this curveball? Inviting someone to church is not evangelism. Because you're the church. So if you just had an open door to talk to them, God may want you to lay hands on and heal them. Jesus never told you to pray for the sick. Jesus said, heal the sick. So if you're a believer, you're there and they've got a problem, you heal them, you feed them, you pray freedom over them. And this is where we, I'm going to say that again, that is evangelism. Evangelism is not inviting. That's why people accuse us of proselyting because we'll invite people. Oh no, we got a better church than your church. You leave your church. You come to my church. You, you, you leave your mosque. No, I want to introduce you to Jesus where I am. I want you to have an encounter with Jesus where I am. Number two, something that's a biblical paradigm that has changed our life and step and I heard this years ago. I didn't believe it. Stephanie said it's in the Bible. And I said, I don't think it is. But it is that to every man has been given a measure of faith. Say every man. Every man. Not every spirit-filled believer. Right. Not every Christian. Not every Caucasian. Not every African-American. Every man. That means that every person breathing has a measure of faith. Right. My job in evangelism is to meet them where their faith is. So if their faith is in work, if their faith is in science, if their faith is in education, if their faith is in Allah, if their faith is in Buddha, if their faith is in Krishna, I don't bash that faith. I do what the Apostle Paul did in Acts 19. I begin to ask them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Well, I hadn't heard of the Holy Ghost. Well, have you been baptized? Well, I was baptized, but not like you're baptized because I was by John and all this. He rewound until he found what they believed. Right, he met right. them on their measure of faith. If every man's been... I'm giving you a tool right now. Some of you are listening. Are you ready? People at your school... You say, I can't talk to them. They're a witch. Oh, that's awesome. I love witches. I love Wicca because it means they have a heart for the spirit. They have a heart for the supernatural. So I'm going to meet them on the supernatural. I'm going to say, you read me and tell me what I'm doing. Read my palm and then let me tell you what you're doing. 
You say, what are you doing? Because they have a heart for the supernatural. They're ready for miracle signs and wonders. I walk in miracle signs and wonders. So I'm going to meet them on the level where they are, and I'm going to take them one step. And every step I take them, it don't matter who they are, Buddha, Allah, that next step is Jesus. It don't matter what they say. It don't matter what their faith is. The next step is Jesus. Okay, so the main thing, he just told me, okay, we got to close this thing out. I mean, have you been bored? No. Are you learning anything? But we've said all this about reimagine church and reimagine discipleship, evangelism, and there's some cool things happening. One thing that we're working on this year, hopefully by Easter, but I really have a heart and we all have a heart. We would love to create a virtual experience, not just streaming live, which we can do that, but how many of you would love to have a virtual experience where we could have a virtual church worldwide? Because we have an audience larger around the world than we do here because a lot of people locally don't know us that know us worldwide. And that's one of the methods we're going to use. But in talking about all that vision and all of that, I just felt I had a word last night and I want to speak this over you we can reimagine church all we want to but I've come to speak to you individually that it's the will of the Lord going into 2019 that somebody in this room dreams again and because of your disappointment and because you have been taught by Jesus you fellowship with Jesus and you know his presence but something shifted where you haven't seen him felt him or experienced him like you used to you have got so disappointed you've gone back fishing You've got so disappointed, you've given up on that part, and you've gone back to what works. Well, I'll ju- I've heard this so much in ministry. My dad used to say it every Monday morning. I'll just go get a real job. <laughs> he used to every every month after he preach on Sunday. I'll probably say it tomorrow. I'll just go sell cars because every week when you're through ministering, you feel like you failed. But I'm preaching to somebody in this room. Don't allow disappointment and disillusionment and depression to pull you back in. Because Peter was one person, but when he said, "I'm going fishing." All the other ones said, no, we're going to follow you. We don't have no any, anywhere to go either. And you have to understand, the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee was a multimillionaire in that culture. They owned a fleet of fishing boats. They are masters at fishing. So what they were going back to had worked four years before. But after they have encountered Jesus, now it doesn't work because Jesus had shifted a word over them. He said, you were fishermen, but now I have called you to be fishers of men. you got to stay with me right here because if I was a real preacher, I'd preach this. When Jesus puts a word over you, he will shift that the ministry you used to have will never work. So you can go back and try to do that. I can try to default and be the old Jonathan Zuber and breathe heavy and jump up and down and knock over chairs. And if I do that, I'm going to alienate the people that God has called me to win and that God has called me to reach. So we have to be willing. Are we going to constantly keep going back and trying to be something? And the word we know the word of the Lord has shifted over us. He said, you're not a fisher anymore. Now you're fishers of men. How's that working for you? It's not working good. So I guess I'll go back and catch fish. And here's the thing that blows my mind about this story. They look up and there's somebody sitting on the, standing on the, on the side of the sea. And here's the thing. The scripture came alive to me last night and this morning. They did not know it was Jesus. Say that. They did not know it was Jesus. They didn't. It said they didn't know it was Jesus. So they are not receiving this as a prophetic word. They're just so disappointed and tired that they're looking for any kind of advice. Have you ever been to the point that you're so frustrated and disillusioned and what you've tried has not worked that you would try anything once? They did not know Jesus. It was just somebody with an idea. I'm speaking to somebody prophetically. You need to take your fingers out of your ears and you need to listen to what the Spirit is saying. It may be in a book. It may be in this sermon. It may be in a podcast. But what is challenging your spirit to do, to reimagine, to dream again, to try one more time? He said, take your empty net, go the other side of the boat, do it completely opposite than the way you've been doing it. And when they did it opposite the way they've been doing it, they do it across the side of the boat and they come up with a great harvest of fish. So that the nets were almost about to break. Who is God speaking to today? Dream again. Yeah, come on, come on. Father, I feel your anointing right now. Every eye closed, and I, I, I know this has been a little different today, and I, I love it. I love how I love working with my son. I love how we just play off each other. The revelation is in this room, but I'm speaking a word to somebody right now. There is a word that you have lost your dream. So because you don't know any better, when you're discouraged and disillusioned, you go back into the old you. You revert to your old way, your old girlfriend. No, I'm talking about your old job. 
I've seen people in great marriages that are really going to be successful, but when they hit the first bump, they run back to the ex-wife, ex-husband, even though that relationship was dysfunctional. But it's safe. It's what you knew. I'm telling you, it's time to reimagine. Reimagine something you've never known. The pastor, the career's hard. I know it's hard. The ministry's hard. I know it's hard. My marriage, my children, my, my I have teenagers, Pastor. That's all you have to say. I understand why some animals eat their own young. No, that's all you have to say. But why don't you begin to reimagine the way that God's giving you that's unique, that can bring peace, that can bring wholeness, that can bring provision. But before we do that, I want to speak to people in this room that you're disappointed. And the spirit of disappointed is on, or disappointment is so strong on you that it is trying to force you into your default mode. It's trying to force you into how you used to serve God, how you used to pray, how you used to worship, how you used to minister. And it's forcing you into an old model that you know don't bear fruit, but you don't know what else to do. I wish you'd jump up and throw your hands in the air right now. I wish somebody in this room, they say, I'm, I'm struck, Pastor, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in life. I'm disappointed in my health. I'm disappointed in my relationships. I'm disappointed in how I'm serving God. I, I'm just living in disappointment. Keep standing. That's okay. Keep standing. Keep standing. We're going to reimagine in a moment. God, I thank you for these incredible people that are here right now. And now to those of you that feel, Pastor, you're talking to me. I feel like I am the church. I feel like God is trying to give me creative concepts and creative ideas. I feel like the Lord is trying to show me how to do something that's so unique and so different. But I don't have a lot of help. I don't understand. All I, I need the strength to cast the net. You ought to jump up right now. I need the strength to start the podcast. I need the strength to write the book. I need the strength to walk away from that job so that I can enter into this job. I need the strength to go to that family and to minister. And I need the strength to go reconcile. I need the strength to ask forgiveness. I need the strength to go on a 40-day fast. I need to, whatever the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you in this room right now. Hallelujah. Now would everyone stand, and I'm just going to pray over you, and our team's going to come, and Stephanie's just going to get back in this song, and there's an anointing. Now, what I love about this service, Alex, is it's only been an hour and 15 minutes. What I love about this service is we don't got to, we don't got to push it. There's nothing in between me and the Super Bowl. But a couple of hours, so don't worry about it. We got time. We got time. Your chicken wings aren't going to rot. We got time. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to somebody. And I speak against disillusionment, disappointment, discouragement. In the name of Jesus, keep your hands up. I'm telling you, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking over you. That heavy heart is going to be mended. That dark cloud that's been over your head. I didn't say this in the other services, but I just keep saying it. That cloud of depression, that cloud of disappointment, by the authority of the name of Jesus, it has to go. I'm telling you, it does not have authority in this place. Now with everyone standing, if you don't mind, I know we have guests. If you're uncomfortable, that's fine. But if you're comfortable, take somebody by the hand. We're going to raise those hands. Pastor Stephanie, I want you to sing this song prophetically. There's been such an anointing. Our worship today, I think, was as good as I've ever heard it. It was incredible this morning. And I just want her to go off in this and just declare this over you. I'm not going to be stuck in who I used to be. I'm not going to be stuck even if I was a success then. Even if that's my comfort zone.